Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, today we are visiting with Amanda Radke about the challenges she sees the American rancher facing today. This is a fun conversation because I don't do very many opinion episodes. As you longtime listeners know, I primarily share about management practices. Because this is an opinion episode, I do want to remind you that Amanda is sharing her opinion as an independent producer who is not affiliated with any industry membership organizations. Her opinions are also not meant to be representative of any current or previous episode sponsors. If you are familiar with Amanda, she is is a fifth generation rancher from Mitchell, South Dakota, alongside her husband, Tyler, and their four children. She's the host of the Heart of Rural America podcast and radio show, a syndicated columnist, a Western retailer, a consultant with CK Consulting, co-owner of Bid on Beef, and a children's book author focused on promoting ag literacy in schools. And currently, she also serves as an appointee on the National Agriculture Campaign Advisory Council, where she provides industry insights to the U.S. House of Representatives Agriculture Committee. Now, I because it is an opinion episode, I am really curious where you guys stand as my listeners. You know, I don't really get to know exactly who's listening, where you're listening from, and what matters to you. So after you listen to this episode or anytime you're thinking about it, please go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and send me a message about what you're thinking, what your thoughts are. Do you agree with what we talk about today? Do you disagree? I want to hear where you guys are at and what matters to you as listeners. So with that, let's visit with Amanda. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for our cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it is saving us hours. From basic inventory management to calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves, Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also work with multiple supply chains to offer alternative marketing outlets for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data back on our calves to help us make informed breeding choices for the next year. To learn more, head to their website, breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is in the show notes. Well, it's an honor to be joining you today. And I'm just so proud of all the work you're doing and the platform that you've built. So excited to have a conversation with you today. Well, thank you. So, you know, you are a woman who wears many different hats and I've already read your bio for the intro and you're well known within the industry already. So a lot of listeners probably already know exactly who you are, but I really want to talk to you today kind of about the spirit of the American rancher and what challenges they're facing today, because you really have your hands in that arena right now. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, just describe the spirit of the American rancher as you see it? Yeah, uh, you know, the American cattle man and woman built this country. I look back to the rugged independence and the grit and determination it took to travel across this country and set down roots and start raising cattle and and their families and and the the amount of labor it took, whether it was carrying water or planting by hand or dealing with the constant wind on the prairie and just all the challenges that it took to establish the beef cattle business and and the American dream here in the United States. And oftentimes I think, man, I I should have been born in that that time. I would have been really great at that. And and yet I believe that rugged independence, that spirit of freedom and adventure and taking on challenges and being able to have that grit and that willingness to put in that hard labor, it still exists today. And it's going to be the spirit of the American cowboy and cowgirl to to save this country. And so to me, steak equals freedom. Ranching equals freedom. Uh, it's 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 something that's hard to put into words. And I might sound like I'm talking hyperbole, but to me, what happens on the land with that rugged, independent cattle ranching family uh, is a beacon of hope for where we're headed. And I think we're born for such a time as this. I That's very powerful. And you know, each generation has their own challenges that they face. And there's sometimes too, I think, you know, it would be great to have been born 50 years ago, 60 years ago, but also 
sometimes I don't know if I'm tough enough to handle the winters without my nice tractor too. <laughs> but <laughs> Right. It's uh, I, I think about that. Like we're, we're used to our creature comforts now, and there are so many advancements in agriculture that have made our lives so much easier. And yet the average age of the American cattle rancher is pushing 60 years old. We have the lowest beef herd we have had in 50 some years. Uh, we're seeing losing 1,300 cow calf producers each and every year in this country. We've lost 75% of our family owned feed yards. Millions of acres of, of farm and pasture ground are being gobbled up by mm -hmm. conservation programs and carbon programs and, uh, and development and, and all kinds of other competing interests. And so the, the amount of producers that are still on the land, that are willing to face all of these challenges, that are willing to stick through it all, it's, it's getting fewer and far, farther between. And, and that's where we, we all need to get out in front and start fighting for our industry, fighting for our way of life, and, and really being our own best advocates, because there is no white and shining armor coming to save us. But for me, I've put all my chips on the American cattle rancher. I believe we have what it takes to overcome some of these adversaries. Uh, and, and yeah, it's a, uh, we, we can do it in a heated tractor too, with running mm -hmm. water. And that makes maybe the fight a little bit easier than what the pioneers had to deal with back in their time. Yes and no, but they're, they're different challenges. What we're mm -hmm. facing today are ones that the pioneers maybe necessarily didn't. So before we dive into some of those challenges, which you did already mention a little bit, can you talk a little bit more about how you view your role in helping ranchers combat these challenges? You know, it's evolved over time. Uh, when I was 18 years old, my parents had told me, do anything but be involved in the cattle business. And so in college, I lived all over. I lived in Washington, D.C., in Denver, in Minneapolis. I studied abroad in Argentina, and I saw the world. And, and with that, it opened my eyes to a lot of the things happening in the political arena that impact farmers and ranchers I loved back at home. And so one of the pivotal experiences I had was moving to DC as an 18 year old farm kid who had never been on an airplane before. And my roommate was a vegan animal rights activist from New Jersey. And it really challenged my views. It really put me in a position of having to explain who we are in rural America and probably shaped the course of my career um, because it was a light bulb moment that Hey, there's nobody telling the story of America's cattle ranchers. And there's there we are deeply misunderstood and misrepresented by people who would love to see us go out of business. And so I need to go out and share that story of, of America's beef producers. And then another thing happened to me in college. I was studying abroad in Argentina and and we were on a bus tour and we were headed to Iguazu Falls, one of the most beautiful waterfalls in the world. And uh, we were traveling overnight to get there. And at 2 a.m., our bus full of American students was pulled over by men and guns. And these men and guns came onto our bus. And I'm thinking, this is the end. So, like, we're going to die, you know? And and in my like limited Spanish that I could understood, I heard them talking to the bus driver and he I said, these are American students. And and they said, okay, park over on this barricade. And so for two hours, we are parked in this barricade. And my face is plastered to the window. And I'm trying to see what is going on. Who are these people? Uh, well, I quickly realized they were farmers. They were ranchers. Uh, they were protesting the government there. Uh, they had dead cows that they had lit on fire in protest on the side of the road. And all of a sudden, I didn't see like scary men with guns. I saw my dad, my grandpa, my people I loved back at home. I saw farming families desperate because the government was doing things that didn't allow them to thrive. They were crippling them. They weren't allowing them to export their beef. They were controlling the prices. And I just remember thinking, man, if this ever happens in the United States, something like this, like that just stuck with me forever. Um, and so now fast forward to 2024, what do we see? We see Biden's Green New Deal agenda and his, his, his 30 by 30 agenda that seeks to take 30 to 50 percent more of our land and put it into the federal government's control. Well, what does that look like? It looks like removing grazing rights, removing our ability to log and to mine. It, it looks like taking away leases from ranchers that have been 
running that ground for a century or more. Uh, it looks like a pathway to starvation. And the ultimate goal in all of this is incrementally chipping away at our private property rights. And so at the end of the day, whether it's animal rights activists or climate change extremists or politicians and the media, I see it as a direct attack on our ability to own our land and our livestock and manage them as we see fit. And if we lose those two fundamental things, we will not have family farms anymore and we won't have beef on the dinner table. And so that's what motivates me. That's kind of what pushes me um, in my work and in my speaking engagements. And, and I, I think about those farmers a lot on the side of the road in Argentina. So private property rights, which is something you talk a lot about, mm -hmm. what else for challenges do you really see the American rancher facing currently? Well, a great example of this, and I might not be popular for saying this, but it, at, at our core, if we don't have private property rights, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this push and the government wanting to roll out uh, EID mandates and requiring beef producers to put those tags in cattle. And I, I hear from people all the time, like, well, what's the big deal, Amanda? Or we need it for food safety. We need it for, you know, X, Y, Z. There's a lot of fear driving that. And what I see it as is an increased expense, increased labor, and me having to report my equity, my inventory, and have it tracked by the government that has basically deemed that cows are bad. And so I'm never going to advocate for building bigger government and putting the heavy hand of government on the necks of independent, rugged cattle producers. I see the EID conversation as we already have the ability to, to market our cattle as we see fit, to track our data as we see fit, to do biosecurity measures if we would like by putting in EID and having that traceability. But the second you get the government involved in a mandate, to me that aligns with directly my overall mission, and that is protecting private property rights, that my cattle are my cattle, yours are yours. And in the competitive market, we should be able to manage those assets and market them as we see fit. And right now, individual producers are able to use those EIDs and, and to directly market to feed yards who are willing to pay a premium because they have that information and data. So not only are we mandating it on producers that don't have the labor, the resources, the time, or the money to do these things. But we're also devaluing the, the folks that were incentivized to do it in the first place. And so I'm all for free market capitalism. And, and that to me would be a very prime example in the beef cattle industry, where I think we're dramatically veering away from that free market and free will in the cattle business. So with that, so you've talked private property rights, you've talked about mandates. But earlier you mentioned about how the average age of the American farmer and rancher is increasing. And in a sense, that almost makes it harder for younger people to get involved too, when there's less acres being or available for farming and ranching. Plus, I mean, there's, there's a lot more with that. It's expensive to get us started and it really is. Yeah. But what else do you think these these private property rights, the mandates, how else do you think those are impacting the rising generations? You know, there's so many challenges you could talk about that face beef cattle producers. And there's a million reasons why a young person wouldn't get involved in this business. I mean, it's capital intensive, it's risky, it's volatile. You're trying to compete with the economies of scale, the very established producers with the huge assets and the land and the capital to work with. And so it's it's a hard road. However, uh, my podcast, The Heart of Rural America, was inspired by the people I was meeting on the road speaking. I speak at cattle conventions and women in ag events, farm bureau, farm credit type events, about 50 a year. And everywhere I go, I'm meeting first generation farmers and ranchers who are making a go of it. And they're not following the preconceived traditions and notions that we've known for generations. Uh, when they have access to be able to buy 50 acres or 100 acres or whatever it might be, they know that, hey, I'm never going to have the thousands of acres. So I have to make every inch of ground and every animal I have be as profitable as possible. And that's where in that free market, we're seeing, I'm seeing first generation producers that are 
implementing agritourism businesses, or they're creating beef tallow skincare products that they're selling for 80 bucks a bottle. Uh, they are creating direct to consumer marketing uh, pathways. They are doing innovative and cool things to drive that profitability, to build businesses. And by every metric, established ranchers are saying, well, that's not how we've done it. And, and so it's a hard dichotomy. Um, however, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm actually hopeful for the next generation coming up because I see them leveraging social media. I see them building a brand and a business and, and really being profitable doing it. And so I try to focus on in my speeches, what can we do to inspire innovative and creative businesses that kind of disrupt what we've always done and, and maybe get people talking and, you know, like, oh, why is she doing that? Or that's crazy. And yet when it works, man, it's exciting. And man, there's good things to come. And with a low beef herd and with the fundamentals being what they are, even though they are right now for all the wrong reasons that we're seeing the prices we are now for not positive reasons. I think we're I think if you can position yourself in the market right now and be poised for what's ahead, there are good times to be had in this beef cattle business. Um, but at our core, if we lose our ability to own and manage our land and our livestock in the free market with mandates and the heavy hand of government pressing down upon us, it's going to be an uphill battle. I I think what you said there is key beef cattle business. And I think that's a mindset shift that I appreciate seeing, especially with people more my age or even just a little older than me and even some of my parents and their friends too. But really that mentality of this is a business. And with that, you talked about the success of first generation farmers and ranchers who might be on a smaller scale, but they know their customer and they really focus on serving them in a lot of ways. And I think that makes a huge difference too. Yeah, I love studying successful business owners in inside of the cattle industry and out. And one of the key themes I see over and over again with successful entrepreneurs is find a problem that exists in your community or in the country or where you are and go fix that problem. And so that could look like a lot of different things of what is your talent? What is your skill? What do you have to offer? And how does it add value to someone else's life? Because I think sometimes we've been sold this bill of goods that raising cattle is just a great lifestyle, which it is. It's I have four children. My husband and I love raising our kids on the land. It's a beautiful way to live. However, this is a tough business and we're working nonstop. I mean, after we get off the phone here, we're putting in embryos for recip cows later today. It's going to be an all day thing. We're going to be outside. And, and so if you're putting in all these long hours at the end of the day, you're sacrificing other things. And so it has to pay. The, this business has to be profitable or it's not that buzzword sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what can you do to leverage the marketing opportunities that you have to use your network of, of peers in this industry to help you along the way, to help you skip over some of the costly mistakes that can be made in this business? Because when you make a mistake in the cattle business, it's not a few hundred dollars lost, it's tens of thousands of dollars lost, right? If you make the wrong decisions. And so having a great network of mentors, being willing to try things that haven't been done before, and maybe forgetting the conventional of this is how we've always done it. Though I think those things will serve savvy entrepreneurs and, and cattle producers well in the years to come. Okay. So Amanda, you've already touched a little bit on like what you're doing, how other producers can take action, but what else do you have up your sleeve? Because I know you've always got something else brewing. Yeah. And so this, I have an exciting new project coming out that I think really aligns with my whole mission of letting independent cattle producers in the free market get paid for the work that they're doing. Uh, so along with some strategic partners, I work with CK6 Consulting in the Purebred Angus business. Uh, in the last five and a half years, CK6 has done $150 million in cattle sales through price, price discovery in a live auction setting. And Chris Earl, the founder of CK6, who is such a dear mentor and friend of mine as well, uh, but and such a blessing to work with him, but he's had a lifelong vision of taking that auction concept and that cowboy way of doing business and applying it to 
beef sales. And so in the last six months, we've done four different beef auctions, uh, just as kind of a pilot test with a participating auction or a participating ranch, uh, Texas Beef House. And in those in the last six months, uh, we've averaged uh, just over $31 a pound across the board on, on this beef. And we've realized that when you can take the beef to the general public and let them determine the price, uh, you're not putting a cap on what it is worth. And so Bid on Beef is the platform. We're going to work with ranchers from all across the country. Uh, we're really focusing on a high quality, high marbled, great beef eating experience. And so we're carefully vetting the producers. They have to be working with a USDA shipping facility. They have to be able to ship across the country. And uh, the platform rolls out June 1st. And basically, we're going to have auctions every week. And so one of our first auctions is going to be out in New York. And we're going to be selling to consumers in Rochester and Buffalo and New York City. And the really cool thing is we're putting the consumer in the driver's seat where they can pick the ranch, they can pick the cut of beef, and they can pick the price. And it's a vulnerable position for the beef producer to be in, of course, because you could sell the beef for way high or you could sell it for under the money. But for us, it is a way to bridge the gap between producer and consumer. It's solving a problem that producers have because when I say, oh, there's money to be made if you go direct to consumer, well, how many ranchers actually have time to go sit at farmer's markets every Saturday or sell steaks online every single day of the week? But in 90 minutes, we could sell a couple thousand pounds of beef. You ship one day, you have happy customers and hopefully happy ranchers that are getting paid a premium for their work. And so excited to roll that out. And we'll be talking about that plenty in the months to come. But the website is bidonbeef.com. That is super cool. Yeah. Super cool. Do you have cool season pastures that you wish you could graze in the summer? Or maybe you graze corn stalks but wish that ground could provide a little extra nutrition. Or perhaps you watch your fallow wheat acres bake in the sun all summer, providing no additional income. For all these situations and more, at Green Cover, they've got the seed and expertise to get you covered. They listen to your needs to design a custom seed mix that works for your unique situation. They grow over 60% of their inventory through contract producers, and they deliver it right to your door, no matter where you are at in the country. With over 120 species in stock from sorghum sedans, millets and cowpeas to oats, rye, clovers and peas, they have everything you need to keep your ground covered and feed your livestock. Reach out to their expert sales team to get a quote today or visit their website at greencover.com. Okay, Amanda, so I want to go back and, you know, talk about the challenges we're facing as ranchers. When you see ranchers being proactive in trying to make a difference, what are some of those actions they're taking? I think being proactive means taking ownership of the results that so often in the cattle business, we're focused on the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, I, in my speeches, I talk about that as, as the operational, the tactical, I, I've got to feed hay, I've got to fix fence, I've got to breed cows, I got to put up hay, you know, I've got to, I got to do all these things, plant and harvest. That keeps us really focused with our nose to the ground. And obviously the business falls apart if we're not executing the labor required for the cattle operations we have. However, I think it's really important and the ones that are that are seeing the big picture, they're they're taking on their own time and their own dime uh, to get involved, to go testify in front of their legislative bodies, to to write letters to the editor, to do interviews, to share with other people, to engage in groups or organizations that can help they can link arms and fight side by side. Um, they see that this is a moment in time where incrementally we are losing our freedoms to farm. And if we do nothing, if we are apathetic, uh, the story will be told for us. The results will be written by someone else. And I, I think that's why I said, I think we were born for such a time as this, because if it's not us, then who? And so really my goal when I'm speaking on the road is to activate producers to say, you have something to offer this industry. You have a voice, you have a story and you can make a difference. And chances are along the way, while you're making a difference, you can also build a very profitable value added marketable cattle business that will create pathways for your kids and grandkids and, and future generations to come. I appreciate that. And I, when I think of the cattle producers that I look up to, it's the ones who are taking the time away from their operation, no matter how hard to find ways to testify, 
be involved, reach out and share that voice in ways that matter to them. Yeah. Oh, and I could give you a good example of this. Uh, in South Dakota, there's a carbon sequestration pipeline that mm -hmm. wants to come through. There's it's a multi-state project. It's foreign owned and, and a, a privately owned company, and they want to use eminent domain for their private gain. And a lot of our politicians have been bought off in the process. There's millions of dollars being spent uh, in our South Dakota primary and our elections to make sure the votes go their way. And yet I locked arms with grassroots citizens, landowners, farmers, and ranchers who have never been involved in the political process. They, they just want to be left alone. They want to raise their families and take care of the land and be stewards of our natural resources. And yet every time I headed, headed to the state capitol, there was hundreds, hundreds of producers that would show up and sacrifice so much to be there. And, and they spoke the truth. And I think the truth is attractive. The truth is hard to deny. And when you have that truth on your side, you can have passion, you can have purpose, and you might not have the slick lobbying groups. You might not have, you know, the big lawyers that show up, but you have that earnestness. You you have that, that undeniable truth that no matter what, um, you know, you can go to bed and sleep well at night knowing you stood up for what is right. And so to me, this battle, um, which has been just very intense in South Dakota and my beloved home state where freedom is supposed to reign true and king. And now at the end of the day, the way our legislative body has acted, I, I look at my pastures a different way that a private company, a big corporation, as long as they could increase the tax base. We actually have no private property rights here in South Dakota that a pipeline or a wind turbine company or solar panels or a hydro project can just come and plop their business right on my land and I'll have no say. And so it, in that way, although I say I'm super hopeful about the opportunities in the beef cattle business, at the end of the day, if we don't keep our government accountable and if we don't reduce the just massive overreach of some of these politicians, it's going to be really hard to hope and plan for the future, knowing someone could just strip that dream away. Yeah, that is challenging. I know there's not on our land, but on land we rent, um, there's supposed to be a bunch of wind towers that now my husband and I will have to work around on the lawn of farm ground. And then my parents, a lot of the land around them is getting put into solar panels. And that's, that's sad to see because it was good pasture ground too. It's devastating. And it, it does go back to that. It is a pathway to starvation. It is taking good farmland out of production where we can feed people, being mindful that one in four kids goes to bed hungry at night in this country. Mm -hmm. And it is taking that land out of production. It is eliminating the dreams of so many small and mid-sized family-owned farms and ranches. And it's ushering in the Green New Deal at a rapid rate. And I, I remember when AOC came out with her Green New Deal and the farting cows and all of that, you know, agenda. And I, I remember we all laughed. We all thought this lady is crazy. And we debunked that. And we talked about the 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 carbon footprint of the beef cattle business and how how actually we are an environmental success story and that the U.S. beef industry contributes less than three and a half percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. And so like, what are we even talking about? And yet fast forward just a few years and the same people who stood alongside me saying this is a joke, this is not something we can say take seriously. Now, thanks to federal government 45Q tax credits, it is like the Wild West right now to capture this carbon cash, to prove that you're sustainable enough to, and and to me, I, I guess apparently we can turn producers into Green New Deal cronies really quick because people will tell me, well, there's money to be made. And so it is the gold rush right now. Everybody's trying to grab their piece of it. But what they don't realize is, yes, the early adopters will get paid for some of these programs. But the devil is in the details. And just like anything, just like EID could be a marketing tool for beef cattle producers, we are not, we have now inched to making it a mandatory thing. The same with carbon scores. What is now being incentivized for people to voluntarily participate in, whether it's right or wrong, that's a whole another debate. Within 10 to 15 years, these carbon metrics will be the standard, will be mandatory. And again, and I've probably learned this and kind of pieced it all together 
um, from 20 years of fighting this. I saw the exact same thing happen and is happening with animal rights activists, where in California, they came in and said, well, we just need one more inch in your gestation crates, or we need this, this, and this, just tiny little things that they present as compromise. And I always say, when you're sitting down to the table with someone and they have everything to gain and you have everything to lose in that conversation, it is not fruitful to compromise with people who want you out of business. So those tiny compromises, the big guys were able to affordably uh, implement some of those new regulations. But what happened to the small and mid-sized farmers? They were pushed out of business. Fast forward 20 years later, those hog producers that maybe saved themselves with that original compromise 20 years ago are now also getting pushed out of business. And so there comes a point where you have to hold the line and you have to say, enough is enough. I'm not compromising with animal rights activists. I'm not compromising with Green New Deal politicians and climate change extremists because it's not the truth. And the truth is America's cattle ranchers are exceptional stewards of the land. They are exceptional at taking care of our natural resources. And they take a beef animal and utilize feedstuffs that would otherwise end up in landfills. They utilize grass that would otherwise turn into a wasted desert. And they convert it into the most nutrient-rich, powerful superfood in the world with 100-plus byproducts. And we have that story to tell and yet we're too busy debating with people and compromising with people that want us out of business. It doesn't make sense to me. And sometimes a lot of that fighting is within the industry too, within beef, between beef producers, because there might be people, in fact, there probably are people listening to this who might disagree with what you've shared today. I mean, totally. that's just, there's people <laughs> all over the board, right? There is. Yep. So, but with that, because people can disagree, people can have different thoughts and goals for their operations. And that's fine. We all have those. And that's part of what makes us America too, in a lot of ways, is we can have those different opinions, although the truth is the truth. Um, what core issues do you think we can come together on, though, even if we do have differences and opinions on a lot of things as beef producers? Yeah. So as you're talking about that, I'm thinking of specific people that really might not like what I had to have had to say in this interview. And I guess I'd like to take the time to set the record straight um, because there's been a lot of misconceptions or things that people want because I've been very public on these issues for almost 20 years. Uh, many people might know me from writing for Beef Magazine for 13 years, four blog posts a week. So I, I talked a lot about a lot of these issues really when I first was getting started in this industry and uh, people want to pigeonhole you, right? They want to say, oh, she's an NCBA gal or she's an RCAF gal or whatever. Uh, but for me, I made a very conscious decision early on in my career because I, I wanted to be a speaker and I wanted to look at all issues not based from the lens of an association or an organization or a board of directors, but from the lens of an independent cattle producer that's just studying the issues. Uh, so I made a conscious decision early on not to join any of the trade organizations. I've spoke at all of them, U.S. Cattlemen's, RCAP, and CBA. I understand the nuances and the division and the disagreements within our industry. I get that. But at the end of the day, in order for us to be effective, I think all associations every cattle organization, every beef producer has to look at the reality that we are losing 1,300 cow-calf producers each year in this country, that our nation's cow herd is at an all-time low, that we're seeing land being gobbled up by the millions. What are we doing to protect the individual farming and ranching family? What are we doing to keep producers on the land and to keep beef on the dinner table. What we shouldn't be doing is fighting amongst ourselves. What we need to be doing collectively, and the constitution lays it out for us, is to protect free will, to protect private property rights, to protect the individual citizen, give them an even playing field, whatever that looks like, and allow winners and losers to be decided in the private sector with innovative and independent business owners, period. All right. Well, I think that is 
a great place to round out our conversation, Amanda. I really appreciate everything you've had to say and share with the audience and just kind of ignite that patriotic fire and everyone who listens to this, I hope. And again, um, reignite that spirit of the American rancher. So thank you for visiting with me today. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on that conversation. Now, if there's one thing I think we can all agree on, it's that we need to stand up for ourselves and what we believe and find ways to do that and share our message. So with that, if you are interested in learning more about Amanda, please go to her website, amandaradke.com. I would really love to hear your thoughts and opinions on what we talked about today. Good, bad, agree, disagree. Let me hear them. Head to my website. And if you use the contact us feature, you that email or that if you send a message there, that will go straight to my inbox and we can have a conversation there. Like I said, I want to know what issues matter to you as a rancher um, and what you thought of the conversation today. So with that, happy ranching, folks. <laughs>